thank you again so much for joining us. If you're just coming on, I'm Amanda with BookWorks, and we're here with Bill Haggerty for his new book, Discovering the Colorado Plateau, A Guide to the Region's Hidden Wonders. And let me tell you, Bill has a lifetime's worth of experience exploring this area. He lives up in Grand Junction, but he is a lifelong naturalist, a photographer. He has been a reporter for the Grand Junction Daily Sentinel, a wildlife enthusiast to boot. He has taught journalism at Mesa State College. He is here with his new book, Exploring the Colorado Plateau. He is also the author of Hiking Colorado's Western Slope, one of those great falcon guides that we like to carry in the store. Best easy day hikes around Grand Junction and Fruta and Haggerty's Hikes in a Bottle. I love the name of that one. We're excited to hear more about his work and we hope that you enjoy the event. Be sure to let us know if you have questions. We're gonna start off with some slides. Bill, thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited to hear more about your discoveries along the Colorado Plateau. Good deal. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I thought well, I, we could start off with a couple of slides just to keep people in the mood, especially since it's so hot outside and we can stay in, in swamp coolers inside for a bit. <laughs> So let me crank this on and we'll just go with this. It's about a 10 minute slideshow and it, it pretty much encompasses the entire Colorado Plateau. One 
sharing there. All right, good deal. Okay, thank you. That was a wonderful little introduction to the Colorado Plateau. Of course, the more iconic places that we know, like the Grand Canyon and Mesa Verde. What are the boundaries exactly for those of us that may not be as familiar with the geography as you are? Where is the Colorado Plateau exactly? Well, that's a real good question. Most people don't know. Um, it's actually encompasses the entire Four Corners area, you know, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, and New Mexico. It extends all the way up north in Colorado to Dinosaur National Monument, and then kind of down the uh, east side. It doesn't extend all the way to Salt Lake, more to the east side of the Wasatch, all the way down to the Mogollon Rim, which cuts all the way down to the north rim of the Grand Canyon and then kind of winds its way back toward uh, Bistai de Nazin and El Maro, El Mal Pais, that area, and then kind of comes back up. A lot of people include the uh, Southern San Juan Mountains, um, but I left it out here just because it's such a huge chunk of property and I didn't, I didn't think I could do it justice. So, you know. It got gotcha. So plenty of places to visit in the book, it sounds like. What are some of your favorite sites that are covered in this particular guide? Well, you know what? I'll tell you what, especially for the audience around there, this Dai De Na Zen just blew me away. It really was one of the coolest places I've seen from just from weird wild rock structures, you know. It was it was really interesting. It is hot and barren and dry. I mean, nothing grows out there. There's some, uh, there's some type of barrel cactus. I think it's pretty rare. And there's like, I saw like two of them. So, you know, but it's, uh, it's kind of barren out there. I really, really enjoyed that though. And of course, you know, Canyon de Chez and Chaco uh, from a historical standpoint, they're just, they're fabulous. They're just fabulous, you know. But, but there's a whole bunch of them. I mean, you know, I love the Black Canyon of the Gunnison. Um, I love all the areas outside of Moab, the White Rim uh, below Island in the Sky out in Canyonlands, I think is fabulous. So yeah, it's just wonderful. That, it, that's what's so great about the Colorado Plateau. 80% of it is public or on, in, uh, on a Native American reservation. And, you know, there are five or six major national parks and everybody jumps from national park to national park, but there's a whole bunch of public property out there that, that I think is just magnificent, you know. Wow, amazing. I didn't realize it was such a large chunk of land. 80%, you say, that's incredible. And, and about, I, you know, it's about 140,000 square miles. So it's a chunk of property, but yeah, there are more, uh, national monuments, national parks, public property here on the Colorado Plateau than anywhere in the lower 48, that's for sure. That makes sense. And do you think that land will be continuing to increase with our new interior secretary? Have you been keeping up with that at all? Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, we have the uh, BLM National Headquarters here in Grand Junction now, you know, all 27 people. Nice. You know, when, they, when that BLM made that move a few years ago, you know, there are these big banner headlines in the local paper that said, boy, we got 27 new jobs. <laughs> and the next day, Halliburton laid off 148. Aye, aye, aye. But that, you know, that didn't make much of a splash on a national headline, you know? So, yeah, uh, yeah I've been keeping up on the BLM deal. I do think, I do think they've made tremendous strides in the last couple months because it was, it just got, beat up. The, our resource people, our resource personnel are overworked, underpaid. You know, there's, you know, five probably law enforcement rangers for the entire Colorado Plateau. That includes Forest Service, BLM, Park Service. I mean, you know, incredible. if you starve the beast, if you have to spend all your money on your budget to send 27 people back and forth to Washington, D.C. every year, you don't have any money in the rest of your budget to actually do something. And that's, I mean, I'm critical of that portion of it because I think that's a, a waste of good taxpayers dollars. Plus these are, these are priceless resources, you know, and 
especially as water gets more scarce in the West, our places are going to get more scarce too, you know. And how have you seen the lands change there in Bill's backyard? I know you've been exploring this area for decades now. And what have, what have you seen? What's been striking to you as far as big changes, small changes? We talked a little bit about land acquisition, but what else have you seen as you've been out in nature? Industrial tourism. You know, Edward Abbey coined that term decades ago. And really, I mean, I do believe that one of the greatest threats is, is massive tourism. And, you know, and one of the things Abby said years ago is that that industry loves loop drives because they can start at the gas station, do a big loop and come back to the gas station. You know, I mean, there's so much more that's going on out here right now um, that it's hard to kind of get your hands on. I, one of the tough things about writing a book like I wrote was exposing it to more and more people that don't have a clue on how to respect the outdoors, you know? I mean, most of the people who are gonna read this probably have a pretty high respect and high regard for the outdoors. But, but boy, there are a lot of idiots out there right now just ripping it up, you know, hopping on their $35,000, $40,000 razors and just tearing, tearing things up. And, uh, and I don't think that's responsible. And in this type of an environment, where we only get, you know, eight inches of rain a year, it's going to take decades or centuries for some of the damage to, you know, be repaired. So what can we do then um, as responsible hikers and wildlife people, people that might like your book and and be readers of your book, what can we do to ensure that these lands are around safe for our kids or grandkids? Do you have a few tips? Well, you know, I mean, the biggest tip is just like you mentioned to me, pay attention. You know, are you paying attention? Are you, are you watching what's going on? And the other thing is, you know, even though I'm not obviously into industrial tourism, you have to get out and experience it. If you can't experience it, how are you going to save it? You know, if you don't hear that canyon rent, in fact, oh, we were talking about readings. There's, <laughs> there's one little part I thought I could, might be able to read that kind of <clears throat> discusses that a little bit, if I can find my place. Um, you know, okay, let's see, I'm gonna, I'll jump in at an appropriate point here. In the introduction, um, I write yet, as I write about this marvelous place, I do so with much trepidation and quite a bit of self-admitted hypocrisy. I battle the demons of my own conundrum. While I sing, take only pictures and leave only footprints and rail against extractive industries chomping at the bit to rip up a little piece of this heaven on earth. I drive a fossil fuel, fuel powered vehicle hundreds of miles to visit these sacred places. I've left a large carbon footprint I lament the once open environs such as world-class parks like Zion and Arches, yet I write about Grand Staircase and Bears Ears only to watch more people come. Author and public lands advocate Amy Irvine writes in her excellent book, Desert Cabal, A New Season in the Wilderness. The minute there's a line drawn around these lands, a sign staked on their behalf, the masses come running. They come at full tilt with their mountain bikes, ropes, and GoPros. Rick Moore from the Grand Canyon Trust goes a little further. All evidence suggests that tourism is the greatest single threat to the archeological resources of the plateau. But who will come to their rescue if you've never heard the call of a canyon wren? Will those who've left or who have never felt the ebb and flow of the Green River or experienced it, its stunning magnificent magnificence as it winds through desolation in Great Canyons, ever write their representatives and tell them to keep it flowing freely? How can one feel the stillness of a star-filled night in Valley of the Gods without respectfully entering that valley? How can we experience the spiritual sensation of peering into an ancestral Puebloan home without following the paths of the ancient ones. 
And that's, you know, that's kind of the deal. Whoa, that's not supposed to tell a marketer. <laughs> you know, that's kind of the deal is, is we do need to get out there and experience it, but we do need to tread lightly. And when you see other people who aren't, try to approach them. I know how hard that is, you know, and, and I don't like to be accosted, but I've been accosted. And, and you still got to stand up and say, hey, you know, be cool here. Be cool. Don't waste this for everybody. So that's what I'd suggest. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a fine line. I know here in New Mexico during the pandemic, we actually had more people getting out to nature and on the trails with businesses and movie theaters and things like that were closed. So there was a lot of news coverage of people leaving trash or people you know, graffitiing a petroglyph or something. And it's always super frustrating to see those things. So I'm happy that books like yours exist that really celebrate these places for the national treasures they are, and also sacred lands to a lot of people that are indigenous to this area. So that's always something we have to keep in mind too. Do you wanna tell us a little bit more specifically about the book? How is it divided up and what will readers find inside? Well, you know, it's, it's uh, divided up into like seven or eight parts. And I, you know, part one is pretty much just dinosaur because that is so unique and it's, it's the northernmost part. And if you think about it, that's where three geologic provinces come together. The Wyoming Basin, the Colorado Plateau and the Rocky Mountain region are all right there, you know. And, and the Great Basin and is not far off. So it's kind of unique in its own self. The next area is kind of combines the Grand Junction Moab area. Uh, then we go down to Cortez, Monticello, uh, Flagstaff and Sedona. <laughs> There's some good stuff. You're going to have to read the chapter on Sedona if you really want to know about vortexes or vortices or, you know, where to find your spiritual center, you know. Um, there's a good section on Navajo Nation, then a section on Bears Ears that includes uh, Grand Staircase. Uh, the Arizona, oh, well, no, Bear, Bears Ears specifically, then the Arizona Strip, then Grand Staircase Escalani. Um, obviously, Grand Staircase Escalani and, and Bears Ears are the most contentious at this particular point in time. Um, but one of the things that I really tried to point out in every single one of these chapters, every single designation of a piece of public property on Colorado Plateau has been contentious, every single one of them, since, since the Antiquities Act in the early 1900s. Somebody wanted to steal something or extract something or travel to something, and it was trash in it. You know, mostly it was looting of, of ancestral, you know, stuff. And it wasn't just private people. I just got back from the Denver Museum of Natural History. There's at least a few pieces that are now mi missing because of the expatriation act that occurred a couple of years ago and the museums had stolen a bunch of stuff or they had purchased stolen sure. stuff. And now they're trying to return that, which yeah. is, which is really cool, but there's a lot of stuff that's lost. And, you know, for every display you see in a museum, there are rooms and rooms of artifacts in the basement of that museum that no one will ever get to see again. Absolutely. You know, and, and those were, yeah. So all of these have been controversial. It hasn't just been Bears Ears and, and Grand Staircase. And I love both of those, you know. However, I will say that the signature activity in Bears Ears doesn't lead you to any particular hike. I'm not leading you to any place. I'm leading you to the Bluff Chamber of Commerce and the, the Cedar National, the State Park Museum outside of uh, Monticello, and then go talk to local and go to the new education center in Bluff for sure. It's great. Right. And then go talk to people and then go out and see what they think. I mean, a lot of those people there in that country are furious with the federal government because the federal government's keeping me from my property. No, well, they're not. None of, none of the roads in Bears Ears were gonna get shut down because of Bears Ears National Monument during the Obama administration, none of them. 
but that's what they think, you know? So there's a lot of misinformation. So anytime you can help clear up mis misinformation, do it, but go out and experience it, you know, go out and see what it's like. Yes, I think it's important always to talk to the locals too. You mentioned that, talk to people, get to know the local culture when you're out at these places and be respectful. Mm -hmm. All right, what have you seen as far as global warming in this region? Is it having an effect on any of the places that are covered in your guide? It's had an effect on every single place that's covered in the guide. Every single place has been affected by global warming. You know, plants are growing, plants are trying to get higher in elevation and away from the heat. There's no water. That's always been a, an issue on the Colorado Plateau. You know, we've had major, major uh, drought cycles in the past, back in, you know, 1275 to 1300, back in the 900s, back, you know, I remember terrible droughts here in the early 70s, in the mid 70s when I first arrived here um, in Grand Junction. But yeah, we hit new record all time highs here in Junction this week or this month. You guys have been really hot down there in Albuquerque, I know for certain stretches, although I understand it's a little bit nicer now, that's good. But yeah, everything's been affected by that. And we all need to really pay attention. Water, 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 water is the issue. You know, I mean, I think Mark Twain said, you know, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. And that's the truth. There's a lot of water fights going on right now. Yes. You know, because there's just, there's not enough water in the Colorado River to serve. 40 million people, bottom line. 